Back to the Goldman equation, as I have discussed in the overview, the generation of a signal in the neuron begins with the entry of positive charges in the membrane, or in other words, a depolarization. We now understand that the positive charges that enter the cell are sodium, and they are able to enter because their permeability has increased. The entry of these charges causes a disturbance on the resting membrane potential, which we just calculated with the Goldman equation. Unfortunately, one downside of the Goldman equation is that it cannot tell us how the disturbance caused by the depolarization will impact the membrane potential across time and distance. For us to understand how such disturbances impact the resting potential, it can be best understood if we use an electrical circuit model to map our neuron, which is often referred to as the equivalent circuit model. All right, to make the circuit, we must first establish how the biological components in the neuron relate to the basic structures that we can find in electric circuits. As we have covered, due to its hydrophobic nature, the plasma membrane creates a charge separation between the two conductive mediums by acting as an insulating material. Hence, we can consider the membrane as a capacitor, which is represented by this symbol in electrical circuits. The capacitance C, generated by the membrane, is equal to the stored charge divided by the voltage across the capacitor. The units for capacitance are farads, which are expressed as an F. Because the membrane contains ion channels that let charges move, the membrane is considered a leaky capacitor. The ion channels in this case are a source of conductance because they allow charges to flow. Recall that resistance is the inverse of conductance, so we could technically think of the channels in terms of resistance. In this case, the resistance could be thought of as the fact that the ions cannot freely cross the membrane. However, I will rather keep the conductance because it is more intuitive to think of how channels allow the current to pass rather than how much they impede it. Nonetheless, I will use the symbols of resistors to show the conductors, so make sure you don't get confused with this element. The units for conductance are Siemens and are represented with S. The missing component that we need to establish now is what is the battery of our system, or in other words, what is the source of voltage. To exemplify this property, let's consider a small circuit for one potassium channel. In this simple circuit, you will recognize in orange the potassium channel shown as the resistor symbol. This conductor has a conductance value of lowercase g that is associated with the potassium channel. Okay, now let's consider a first scenario where there is no potassium gradient across the membrane. In this scenario, the only force that acts on the potassium to push it across the membrane is the membrane potential created by the other ions. As such, the force, or in terms of electrical circuit, the battery, is the resting membrane potential, Vm. From Ohm's law, the current across a conductor is equal to the product of the conductance and the voltage. Hence, in the first scenario, the current across the potassium channel is equal to the conductance of the channel multiplied by the resting membrane potential. Now, imagine a second scenario where we only consider the chemical gradient from potassium. From what we went over in our discussion on the electrochemical gradient, recall that in this scenario, the motion of potassium will be influenced by two forces. First, the chemical gradient that drives the potassium to exit, and secondly, the electrical gradient that forces the positive charge to equilibrate the negative charges it leaves behind. For that reason, the equilibrium potential acts as a battery to supply energy to drive the potassium movement. Now, let me mention that by convention, we consider positive current as the movement of positive charges out of the cell. In this scenario, since we consider the chemical gradient, we can expect the potassium to flow out of the membrane. Hence, the outward movement of potassium corresponds to a positive value. Here again, we can use Ohm's law to describe the current through the channel, but to make sure the signs align with each other, the negative sign on the right side must be present because the equilibrium potential of potassium is negative, and we expect a positive current. Finally, let's consider the scenario where the concentration gradient and the membrane potential both act as forces on the potassium. In this scenario, the net current through the channel will be equal to the sum of the currents found in the scenario 1 and 2. By factoring the conductance, 
we arrive at this expression where the current is equal to the product of the conductance and the difference between the membrane potential and the equilibrium potential of potassium. If you remember from our previous discussion, this difference is what we know as the driving force, which we vaguely define as how much the ion wants to enter the cell. But to see what this equation means, let's consider it in more detail by plotting it on a graph. As you might notice, this equation has a linear shape with the current being the dependent variable and the membrane potential being the independent variable. Let's first imagine that the membrane potential is equal to the equilibrium potential of potassium. From what we know from previous discussions, the equilibrium potential for potassium when the concentrations are set as they are right now is in the range of negative 70 to negative 90 millivolts. Regardless of what the actual values are, if the two potentials are equal to one another, you can see that the current will be equal to zero. This makes sense because it means that the electric and chemical forces acting on potassium are perfectly balanced and no net movement is occurring. Now, let's imagine that the membrane potential is higher, let's say 30 millivolts. Then we would expect the current value to be positive. Recall that a positive value of current means that the potassium is leaving out of the channel to the extracellular side. On the other hand, if the membrane potential is lower than the equilibrium potential, then the current will be negative and indicate that the potassium is entering the cell. This graph is usually referred to as an IV plot and it allows to illustrate in which direction current flows depending on the voltage. This is a graph that we will see again and again throughout this video. For terminology's sake, you might sometimes see the equilibrium potential be named as the reversal potential because it is the value beyond which the current direction reverses. Back to this figure, we now have all the basic analogs to properly compare the neuron to a circuit. I just want to mention that the voltage is in units of volts and that the current is in units of amperes. Now let's build an electric circuit that represents the neuron. As we've seen, the important ions that contribute to the resting membrane potential are potassium, sodium, and chloride. Also, we have seen that their channels all have different selectivities and permeabilities. Thus, we must consider each type of channel as separate conductors. As we did with potassium, each conductor is connected to its battery or in other words, their equilibrium potential. In the potassium example we just did, we only considered the conductance of one channel. To take into account the entire population of channels, we can multiply the number of channels by the individual conductance to get the total conductance here noted as capital G. To complete the circuit, we can add a few more important elements. First, we can add the active pumping of the sodium potassium pump, which is essentially a current generator that keeps the batteries charged, and we can also add the membrane capacitance, which is denoted as CM. Thirdly, we can add the membrane potential to the circuit, but it is more often shown in this discrete way, where these two hollow dots correspond to the short circuit symbols with the extracellular matrix on one end and the cytoplasm on the other. The final thing to add is the direction of the currents. Now, let's use our circuit and try to find an alternative equation for the resting membrane potential. To simplify the derivation, we can neglect the sodium potassium pump because its influence on the membrane potential is very small. Also, since we are trying to get a value for the resting membrane potential, we can neglect the membrane capacitance as well. Let's start from the fact that since we are trying to compute the membrane potential, we know that there will be no net flux to the system because it is in equilibrium. In other words, we can translate the statement as there will be no net flux in current, which means that the sum of all currents going through the channel will be equal to zero. Secondly, we have already established in our previous discussion that the current going through each channel is given by the modified Ohm's law, where the voltage is replaced by the driving force. From there, we can solve for the membrane potential by replacing each current with their definition in step two. Then, we can apply a bit of algebra and finally isolate Vm. The final equation we get is very reminiscent of the Goldman equation, except here we deal with conductances instead of permeabilities, but overall they both give a value for the membrane potential. Remember that the purpose of modeling the neuron as an electric circuit 
was for us to be able to quantify the effects of depolarizations on the membrane potential. Beyond the little introduction I made about neurotransmitters at the beginning, we do not know quite yet the mechanisms responsible for depolarizations. One thing for sure though is that these depolarizations do happen and they are what initiate signals. With our new model of the electric circuit, these depolarizations essentially constitute an injection of current into our circuit. As we've seen, such injection of current caused by, let's say, neurotransmitters, must reach a threshold in membrane potential to activate the action potential and consequently propagate the signal. The action potential is often referred to as an active response because of its all-or-nothing nature, whereas the current injections that first build up to the action potentials are qualified as passive responses because of their graded nature. Indeed, passive responses vary in size and are not sustained like action potentials. That is to say, they decay over time if they do not reach the threshold. What I'm trying to emphasize here is that the generation, let alone the propagation of the signal, is entirely dependent on the voltage of the cell. So if you don't reach the threshold, you don't get any action potentials. And the only way that the voltage can change is through these current injections which produce depolarizations. For that reason, the build-up to the action potential in the passive phase is just as important as the active phase in order to properly understand the signaling mechanisms of neurons. With this being said, I want to point out that the circuit that we have built for the moment does not clearly discriminate between what happens during passive or active conditions. Indeed, the passive graded state when we don't consider ligand-gated channels that open from interactions with other neurons, mostly operates through what we call leak channels, which includes a wide variety of potassium, chloride, and sodium channels that are open at rest according to the relative permeabilities we have established. On the other hand, the active all-or-nothing state operates through voltage-gated potassium and sodium channels that are only open at a specific threshold. Hence, you can see how this circuit can get a bit confusing because it does not discern between active and passive channels. To correct it, I will use this circuit instead, where the purple channel represents the currents coming from all the leak channels, and the two other channels are the active voltage-gated channels. As we will see later, the conductances in the active channels change as a function of time and voltage, which is illustrated by these arrows that cross the resistor symbols. As a sort of preemptive note, in the section that we are about to begin, we will focus on understanding how, in the passive phase, the membrane potential changes in response to a current injection. To do so, we will use our circuit model to arrive at equations that describe the behavior of the membrane potential as a function of both time and space. Along the way, we will discuss three important passive membrane properties. To generally describe them, Passive membrane properties are intrinsic properties of the neuron that influence how the membrane potential of the neuron will change in response to a current injection as a function of time and distance. We have already seen two of the three properties. The first property is the membrane capacitance. The second is the membrane resistance or conductance, depending on how you see it. And the third property is the axial resistance. For the moment, I know that they do not mean much beyond what we have discussed, but as we go through the equations, these properties will become much clearer. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. On the right, you will see the informational resources that I've used to produce this video. Thank you again for watching, and I'll see you in our next discussion.